Good afternoon, everybody, for this special webcast. I think everyone knows that uh, the United States is living on borrowed time and facing a fiscal deficit and debt problem that's becoming increasingly structural in nature. What makes today very special in this regard, in terms of the webcast, is that it takes place on the same day uh, that US federal debt just crossed over the $34 trillion threshold and at 123% relative to GDP, uh, which means that uh, we've crossed well above, well above the 90% threshold that Rogoff and Reinhardt found to be the threshold for future economic and fiscal instability. Bottom line is that if left unchecked, the U.S. is soon going to be in the unenviable position of needing to borrow money just to service the debt. And that's exactly what happened in Canada back in the late 80s and early 90s. And you know you've hit the wall when your bond auctions tail or fail, interest rate pressure and volatility escalate, the currency goes into a destabilizing bear market. I wanted to hold this specific webcast because I'm frankly astonished at how little play fiscal stability has been given by the GOP candidates ahead of the primaries. And I also found out after canvassing much of my client base that Americans have no idea that Canada was on the same slippery slope of unsustainable fiscal deficits and debts back in the late 80s and early 90s. And the two gentlemen I have on the call today were at the forefront of turning things around in Ottawa in spectacular fashion, uh, which involved the total rewrite of the social contract, tax increases, spending cuts, and a radical downsizing in public sector employment. It took little more than three years to right the ship, uh, a lot of fiscal pain to be sure. But if you look at the past few recessions, uh, they've been milder in Canada than in the US. And part of that comes down to a stronger government balance sheet north of the border. So consider this to be an education for those who are not aware of the Canadian story. And hopefully this webcast is going to be making its way to Washington. You know, I see border security, foreign policy, abortion on top of the list of debates, but nowhere is there any attempt to come up with a budgetary plan to prevent a future fiscal crisis. And if left unchecked, even assuming no recession, the U.S. is on track to pile up more than $12 trillion of debt just over the next eight years, during which interest costs will not just take over the defense budget, which is already happening, but will also start to dwarf Social Security. That's a problem. Uh, there's a clear and present danger in the failure to clear the decks of all this debt finance spending and the fact that it now receives very little attention, maybe because Treasury yields have come off the boil, I think that should be troubling for all of us. So as a quick introduction, with me today is David Dodge, uh, who I would argue was the most effective governor of the Bank of Canada has ever seen. And he spent years as a senior official in the Department of Finance and was a key architect in resolving the country's fiscal problems. And I also have the pleasure of having John Manley here, who wore many hats in the federal government in the cabinet in that era, uh, from ministry minister to finance minister to deputy prime minister. Uh, presently, uh, John is uh, well situated in the private sector. He's chair of Jeffrey's Financial Canada and senior advisor at Bennett Jones. This webcast promises to be educational. Uh, the primary goal is to describe how Canada got into the mess it did and how the government of the day forestalled a crisis in the making with some very tough decisions, but it was clearly a case of near-term pain for long-term gain. America is either going to be proactive or will choose to wait to the last second as Canada did nearly three decades ago. As usual, this is gonna be an informal and freewheeling fireside chat. And for viewers with questions, please send them in using the questions tab on your right. So I'm gonna start off the discussion with David Dodge. Uh, David, can you give us a quick synopsis on how it is that a, a wealthy G7 country like ours managed to get into almost an emerging market type of fiscal crisis to begin with? Uh, what happened? 
How is the crisis resolved in the end? And what similarities do you see in the U.S. today? And between you and John, towards the end of the webcast, it would be really valuable to provide a laundry list of what you think Washington should be putting on the fiscal table as soon as possible. So, David, over to you first. The mic is yours. Well, thank you, David. Um, as you said, I was there through the, the long uh, run-up uh, of the problem. And the, the basic issue is that governments have a, a, a certain bandwidth. And for a long time, uh, off that bandwidth, not in it, uh, was dealing with the fiscal, uh, the fiscal issue. There were other things to do, very important other things to do in terms of improving the structure of the economy, but that absorbed too much of the bandwidth, that, that restructuring, and it meant that for a long time, uh, we, we continued to borrow, uh, first of all, to borrow for programs, and then, in fact, we ended uh, borrowing uh, to cover the interest charges on the debt. And as we moved through the end of the 80s and into the beginning of the 90s, what was happening is that that service charges were eating up an uh, increasing fraction uh, of the revenue uh, that we had. In fact, by the early 90s, debt service charges were eating up almost 30% of the federal government's revenue. Uh, and uh, this was clearly uh, unsustainable uh, and seen as being unsustainable, but no one wanted to do um, take the necessary steps uh, to deal with it. Um, part of the problem was we had done a major tax cut in 87. Uh, and while we had uh, put in a, a goods and services tax, a value added tax to help pay for it, uh, uh, later, um, that value added tax was very unpopular, um, as one might expect. Uh, the previous government got defeated, in, at least in good part because of that. Uh, and John came uh, with, with uh, Mr. Gretchen, uh, and the plan was to get rid of the GST, get rid of that value-added tax. Well, it became obvious very quickly as we briefed the, the new government that this was impossible to do. They were going to have to welch on that particular promise. And we're going to have to do some very uh, unpopular things, uh, cutting unemployment insurance, cutting other statutory programs, in particular cutting uh, transfers to the provinces that paid for, the, for health care um, in our system. Uh, these were the, the options on the table, none very popular. And so we took some steps in 93, and then further steps in 94 uh, to rein in programs. Uh, we cut operating costs, but operating costs, just as is in the United States, the day-to-day -day operating costs are actually a relatively small part, uh, getting your hands around it. So in the end, in the end, the only thing you can do is actually to cut programs. Um, and that was the great debate within the government. Uh, uh, we had a, a bond auction that almost failed. The Mexicans were in deep trouble, uh, and uh, the, the peso was falling like a rock, and the Canadian dollar um, uh, billed as the, the, the northern peso um, was following suit. So we were in deep trouble, uh, had got ourselves into deep trouble, and so in 95, we had to, to really move on all fronts. And it was a big move. Had the economy performed as we had expected and had interest rates uh, remained where they were, the amount of uh, spending reduction that we were doing, and it was virtually all spending reduction that we did uh, over the period 95 to 97, we estimated would amount to about 6% of GDP. That's at interest rates. If interest rates didn't come down, 
And uh, if we did all those cuts, we thought that the economy would grow a lot slower. As it turned out, and I think this is the important thing. So we, we did a lot, and John and I can discuss it. John uh, has some scars because <laughs> I had penciled John in for a 50% cut uh, in the industry department, uh, which uh, because we had that balance, right? So we, we needed some people to really uh, uh, take, take a cut. But overall, um, you know, our plans were to cut between 15 and 20 percent uh, of spending. And that's real programs, not just the administration. Um, and at the same time, uh, we had the same problem that the Americans have today uh, with Social Security. Uh, we had a Canada pension plan that was unsustainable and, and had to be fixed. So none of that was very popular, but the government... Uh, in, in the end, uh, uh, decided that they, that, that they had, well, they didn't have much choice. <laughs> in fact, we didn't, really didn't have much choice. Um, and so we did all these brutal things. Uh, initially, uh, it, the economy took a hit, but it, it didn't take very long. And I think this is the important thing uh, to point out. It actually did not take very long for that action that we took, to, it was the tipping point that, that moved us back onto uh, a, reasonable, uh, a reasonable projection. And so we had estimated, as I said, that our fiscal actions were going to amount to a reduction of about 6% of, of, of spending in the end the, from 95 to 97. I mean, huge amount, 6% of GDP was going to be cut. Um, in the end, what happened, because uh, markets were convinced finally that we were serious, uh, that so interest rates came down, we had no trouble uh, on, on that front, um, uh, the dollar strengthened, um, and, uh, and, uh, with, with all those good things, what happened was that the American economy was going quite strong at the time, exports uh, increased. And so in the end, what we thought was going to be a 6% reduction uh, in demand, uh, federal government demand, turned out to have the impact of only 2%. So having done it, and it was very difficult to do but having done it, actually the payoff came much faster than we had anticipated. And by 98, 99, we were able to uh, return to, if you will, rather normal operations, although with a pension plan that was stable um, and less generous uh, and with, uh, with transfer payments, which were stable, although somewhat less generous than before, but nevertheless, confidence was back uh, because we had taken those actions. Just uh, before we go to uh, John Manley, just a, a either comment or question from me, which is, was there was this a case where um, the negative, say, fiscal multipliers were? largely offset by the, I guess you'd call the crowding in effect of private investment, you know, like how public borrowing crowds out private investment. So private investment came in to fill the vacuum. We that crowded in private investment. Uh, we crowded in private domestic investment. We crowded in uh, foreign investment, but most importantly, we were able to get uh, enormous benefit from rising exports due to strong consumption abroad. Yeah, which I don't think that the U.S. can, we can't really rely on global consumption this time around uh, to, to drive exports uh, uh, practically anywhere. So, uh, John, but let me turn it over to you. And yeah, okay, but to, to just to respond to that, sometimes you have to be, you have to be good to be lucky. And you can't control the, you know, the you can't control the luck factor, but sound public policy 
is going to give you better overall results than poor public policy. And if you get lucky as well, well, that's an extra benefit. But we would have ultimately reaped those rewards, maybe not as quickly, uh, but, but they were going to happen. Um, and one of the things that I learned out of this was that the, the broad political entity, my, my job was, was to sell this. <laughs> and selling it in part abroad, David and his, his minister sent me to London to make these presentations. And I remember one wonderful visit in the city to one of the big financial firms where I was describing all these things that we were doing that showed that we were on a different course. And he said, ah, you guys from Canada, I've heard all this before. Why should we believe you this time? And I think, David, that skepticism was, was pretty general. And the best answer, uh, the most persuasive answer in the end was look, look at the elements of this package and you will see that we have decided a course that will reduce federal government spending in Canada at a faster rate than we reduced it during demobilization following World War II. That was a telling comparison. And one of the things that I, I think I really learned out of this, considering the experiences of the government that preceded ours, was that when you get into one of these jams, you know, you, it doesn't help to just go to the wall and turn the rheostat two degrees or four degrees and, and let everything else just, because in a department like mine, I had the industry department, if I recall correctly, uh, David, I had 54 programs. Every one of those programs had a constituency that believed that that program was essential to them. They might have been, I don't know, manufacturing, you know, widgets for whatever they were. And that program was essential to them. We had 54 of them. If we had said, okay, we're going to reduce them by 10% each, I would never have gotten to the target that David gave us. What we did was of those 54, we reduced 45 of them to zero. And some of the others we may have augmented a little bit depending and some of them we did need to bring back in, in future years. But this is where um, the, the good can be really the enemy of the, the, the best. Because if we kept all of those programs alive, some of them just weren't that effective. Some of them were too complex. Some of them, yes, they had their constituencies, but they really weren't doing that much good. And there were a lot of things that an industry department such as mine could have been doing that it wasn't able to do because the funds were all going to help the shoe manufacturers uh, in their impossible situation or to help somebody else in theirs. What we did, um, remembering this is the 1995-96 era, one of the things we did was we said, okay, we got a bunch of people whose job it is to answer the telephone. When small businesses phone in and say, you're the government of Canada and I have this problem, why don't we put all that information on this new fangled thing, you know, the internet, and we'll get out there and we'll hire some bright students to help these small businesses figure out how to get onto the internet and find out how to get the information that they need without having to phone somebody. It forced us to innovate is what I'm trying to tell you. It forced us to think of new ways to do things, better ways to do things, to stop doing things that were better not done by government at all, but were better done in the private sector or, or, or better just forgotten about. Um, and uh, I think that was the transformative experience for all of us. The, the other thing that I'd say, David, is that, um, you know, granted our system of government's a little different, but you still have a play in a, in a government. Ours was, I'd say, a, our party at the time was a very broad-based center-left party. A lot of people who consider themselves still to be very progressive, uh, they weren't natural budget cutters. 
Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, Prime Minister Kretschmann, what he did was he basically took a bunch of those people, didn't include me in it because he knew that I was going to be way too far in there saying we need to do more, um, at least to other people's ministries. But he put a lot of those, what you might call spenders, together in a room. And David and his colleagues methodically using evidence, convinced them that the problem that they had to deal with, if they ever, ever hoped that the central government in Canada could be progressive again, was an immediate one. And that if they didn't solve our fiscal mess, you can forget about whatever progressive policy you might have dreamt up, you know, back at home in your constituency. You had to deal with this. It was it was table stakes to being able to do anything else that was important and progressive. And that was transformative uh, because it then enabled people to say, yes, we're going to have to do this for now. It will hurt. But we're going to have to do politically, we're going to have to do one magnificent job of convincing Canadians that we have to do this. We got some help. The peso crisis was one. My favorite one was the editorial that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, which I have to admit, neither then nor now is widely read in Canada uh, among the general public. But when they publish an editorial describing Canada as an honorary member of the third world, that gets wide uh, coverage in Canada. Well, was it, wasn't the title Bankrupt Canada? Yes, it was Bankrupt Canada, question mark. Yeah. And, it, in the, and it had a whole list of indicators that showed how badly we were doing. And years later, as finance minister, by the way, went back to that editorial board and took them through their editorial, all of the indicators, we were now the best performing in the G7. And that was within seven or eight years of their editorial. By the way, they weren't particularly interested in that. Uh, historical retrospective, but their words at the time were very helpful to us as politicians in persuading Canadians that um, this was, if you like, it was force majeure, that we had to act or much worse things were going to happen. And uh, and I think, uh, you know, if I can say so uh, with with some modesty, our government deserves credit for having taken the political risks to make the necessary decisions and judgments that we did. Well, what's really amazing is that, uh, you know, politicians are scared of their own shadow and they think if they tighten fiscal policy, they're not going to get reelected. And I think the Liberals had, what, three majorities during that uh, during that whole time period? It, it gave us three majorities. Uh, yeah, three they were... Majority, yeah. And 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 within a, a, within a short number of years, I think in 1998, David will correct me. We balanced the budget. Uh, yeah, overall. 97. 97. We balanced it overall, including debt servicing. We then ran, I believe, 13 consecutive surplus budgets, which put Canada in very good shape going into the Great Recession in uh, in 2008. In, in fact. In fact, um, Canada did not have a recession in 2001, and the U.S. did. So just a few years after bouncing the books, Canada emerges unscathed from the tech wreck recession. But I want to switch it. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, David Dodge, you were, I think throughout that 1980s, you were a very senior person at Department of Finance. And, I mean, that comes back to the question I had at the very beginning was, how did Canada get into this mess? Uh, how did the the citizens of the country accept this mess? I mean, we were racking up these massive deficits. No, everybody just shrugged their shoulders like they're doing in the states today. Because of course, well, there's no crisis until there's a crisis. But how did we get into this situation? How did it happen? Yeah. So, uh, make make two points, maybe three points about that. First of all. Um, there was a general understanding in the public that there was a, a problem brewing. Um, and indeed, the previous government had spent some time emphasizing 
that there was a problem. And the public kind of looked at it that, you know, I can't, I can't afford to go on year after year increasing my mortgage payments. Um, so there was, it was not, uh, there wasn't a really hostile public. They were very hostile to the fact they were now paying a whopping sales tax. It was visible every time they went into the grocery store or to the gas station. Um, uh, so that, that, uh, and, and they really felt that that was bad. And perhaps that having to pay that tax was worse than, than the financial problem that they saw the government had. But secondly, um, there is only so much bandwidth. John can talk about this better than me. You, you, as a government, you have to kind of pick the things you're going to do. And, and the Moroni government decided on the economic front that they were going to use what political capital they had to try deal with some of the structural problems uh, in, in the economy. Um, to to get the to change the balance between income tax and sales tax, uh, to move, of course, to, to free trade, which was a very um, uh, a very important issue, uh, to get rid of some of the uh, impediments uh, in the economy, particular agreements about freight rates and so on. That, so they they use their political capital to deal with some of these structural problems um, and help. And the prime minister, whenever I would go and sit with him on where we were going, he said, look, I can't do it all, right? I'm going to do certain things and we're going to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, Mr. Dodge, suck it up a bit and find the money. Uh, that, that was, that was a clear decision. Now, by the time John and, and, and Mr. Kretchen and the liberals came back, we actually were getting some of the payoffs from that structure, those structural um, reforms, but we were left with this enormous hole that, that had to be filled. And, and so I, I think it is, you, you, you can't, this government, you can't do everything at once, and the conservatives chose to do the structural stuff, which was very important in the end. Um, and so we did structural stuff. We then did the fiscal stuff, and then, as John said, by the time uh, by the time the the new century rolled around, a we had a stronger structure of the economy, and we had a fiscal situation which was manageable. Um, so I think it is it is important that. That to to recognize that, that there are you can only tackle some things and do it well, um, and and so we did did not uh, through that period uh, up until ninety two. Uh, we just made the government made the decision uh, to deal first with the structure and then we'll come back and deal with, or we will leave it to the next government to deal with the fiscal problem. Uh, there, there's also, I, I, I'm, I may sound a little partisan here, there, there's, there's also political courage is sometimes hard to come by. And early in the Mulroney government, um, although they didn't try to do anything as sweeping as, as, as we did, they did propose some things, including a fairly modest adjustment to um, to an old age pension system that we have in Canada. And there was, there was a lot of noise and objection to it. And the government backed down. And I, I think that in a way set a bit of a tone that, that um, there had to be, uh, in order to convince everybody that you really meant it, you couldn't back down. And the other, the other thing that I think the package that David and his colleagues put together for our government had going for is that it was, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily equally brutal to everybody, but everybody paid. 
everybody was included. And that meant no interest group could come in and say, why me? What about him? Well, there's an old saying, I used to be very active in tax policy yes. in Canada. And, 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 I, and I love the old saying, which is, don't tax you, don't tax me. Tax that guy behind the tree. You know, there's always somebody else. And the, when when we administered this medicine, uh, which, as I say, David and his colleagues proposed it, um, I don't think anybody got left out. Everybody got a dose of the medicine. Well, they didn't all like it, but they couldn't say it wasn't fair. They could only say, why is this happening now? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, David, that we were able to get uh, political acceptance and get reelected despite the measures. But that's that's the, one of the critical questions. I think you know, keeping in mind that I think virtually everybody in the line does not know the Canadian experience. What changed? Uh, I mean, we're racking up deficits. We're at a point where you know, when you added up uh, both the federal, provincial, uh, almost 100% debt GDP, the, the U.S. Government sector is well above that now. Uh, we're basically, uh, I mean, it's a gambler's debt situation. We're borrowing money to to pay off the interest. Um, and so, you know, we were doing that through most of the 80s, doing that into the early 90s. Uh, the Liberal government gets elected in 1993, I think it was, to do even more of that. So, like, what, I think people want to know, what broke the bat? What, what oh, the threat of hanging it done. <laughs> the threat of hanging at dawn. I mean, I mean, we were not. We were. We, we had to go to the prime minister and say, "Prime minister, we cannot, we cannot go and borrow enough money for you to carry on uh, uh, doing what what you actually said you were going to do in your little red book." When you got elected, you okay? Can't. So we're we're talking about Jean Chrétien here in, in the '93 election. That's right, yeah. and 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 so it was, it was, uh, it it was force majeure. It was it was the threat of hanging at dawn. I mean, and so that that forced forced the issue, forced the issue. But I would say the big change that actually made made it easier and I think this is important. The conservative government were viewed as people with green eye shades would who were playing with numbers and and the fiscal issue was kind of a accountants issue and, and so on and that they were tackling it as a, an accounting issue and and so it, it was being tackled the fiscal issue was there. But it was being tackled in, in that sort of green eye shades way. The great thing that enabled Mr. Kretchen to move, I think, and your government, John, the government you were with to move, is that that movement was viewed not as something that they wanted to do. In fact, they really didn't want to do any of it, <laughs> but they had to do it. And and so the, Mr. Kretchen had the, the sort of social credibility that unlike Thomas the Beckett, right? It was a question of, of doing doing the, the deed for the right reason and the conservatives fiscal efforts were viewed as doing the deed for the wrong reasons. And so I think it's very hard. It's very hard for a government without a degree of social credibility to be able to take on uh, the, um, uh, uh, the difficulty um, and, and the immediate pain, the immediate pain uh that those actions uh create uh, but there was no choice there was no choice when you run out of money you run out of money i think i've described to you 
David Rosenberg, the one one morning I'm going into the cabinet room and David Dodge is standing outside. He's the deputy minister of finance at the time. I'm the industry minister. And 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 he looked pretty pale, I have to say. I stopped to see if he was okay. And he told me that we that our, our bond auction had been no bid with 30 minutes to go that morning. Um, and uh, that was a salutary reminder of the fact that um, ultimately there were there were going to be markets that decided these things. And it's uh, it's if you know if I, 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 perhaps during the pandemic we were given the leeway to uh, see governments buy their their own bonds and it and it worked for a while. It's not going to work indefinitely. And uh, either the interest rates will keep, you know, be sky high or there'll be no buyers for those financial instruments and the problem will quickly spiral out of control. So for a small open economy like Canada, undoubtedly different from the situation that even today's US uh, faces, um, we had no choice, we had no choice. The, the next step was, was going to be default um, and, and why did the provinces, which bear a heavy burden in Canada, move along with us? They did because whatever was happening to Canadian government debt was going to happen times two to provincial government debt. And the whole cascade of the problem was going to hit them even worse than it hit uh, the federal government. And everyone knew we were in that same pot and the water was getting hotter. Well, there's there's one other thing you know about that period we're talking we're going back 30 years where the median age of the population and the dependency ratio uh, had a lot more vitality to it than it does today uh i would say that even though the, the people debating in canada it's very interesting to me about how in canada uh there's all sorts of complaints about fiscal policy and yet the debt ratio is is still nowhere near uh, where it is in the in the U.S. right now. So well, uh, that, that, no, that's it, a wor that is a worry to us as well. And I think <laughs> Dave, David and his colleagues at, at Bennett Jones have put out a series of very influential, I think, reports detailing why some of these problems are mounting up. And when you put that in the, in the context, well, including the the aging of the population, Dave, the that's what I'm talking rate. about exactly. Yeah. And, and technological change and what you have to describe as, you can describe it as a turbulent international trade environment, uh, unlike what was relatively uh, positive in the early 90s. Um, you know, the geopolitical conflicts that seem to be flaring up and impacting supply chains, uh, all of these things combined make dealing with your financial capabilities even more urgent. Well, you know, in the U.S., you know, I guess that you could always argue, of course, that uh, being the world's reserve currency, uh, you know, helps them. Uh, I guess have a have a long. Or used to. <laughs> well, or used you know, to. Man. I, I, I well, that's the the question I have here is, you know, go back to my comment about the slippery slope uh, in the U.S. Um, you know the, you, you know, I, I would say that. Um, you know, it, it was probably a blessing that uh, Canada faced the crisis uh, when it did, um, you know, 30 years ago. And especially, you know, the structural changes. I mean, of course, program spending, but program spending from 95 to 97 went down almost 10 percent in Canada, uh, which most Americans look at as some quasi socialist <laughs> European country. Um, John, the, the civil service was mm -hmm. cut by 14% or by 45,000. That would be 450,000 civil servants in the U.S. But, and, you know, Canada Canada did it. But I'd say over and beyond, it was the rewriting of the social contract, like David Dodge talked about before. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, you know, um, means testing, clawing back old age security. Uh, I mean, things that were sacrosanct, sacred cow in Canada. How was how is if it's no longer a sacred cow in Canada? How is it a, still a sacred cow in the United States? And so we saved our we, we dodged a big bullet by making a lot of these changes. 
uh, to GIA, the guaranteed income supplement, the old age security given. And this is going back 30 years ago when we had a much younger population. Think of where we'd be today if we didn't make those structural changes. Well, we made changes to the Canada Pension Plan as well. Yeah. You put all of that together, you've got the equivalent of U.S. Social Security. And I've had I've had, at least in my career as, as finance minister, we had two different U.S. Treasury secretaries say, could you send me a brief on how you made those changes? Because we've got to do something about our Social Security. And uh, clearly, uh, they never read those briefs. We've, we were sending them um, and explaining what it was that we had done and why we had done it. And, and to some extent, how we had convinced Canadians that this was worthwhile doing. Right. Well, uh, you know, the, the other point I think that we, we want to draw out of here uh, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, Canada's, you know, fiscal history and, and how we get out of it. You know, what, what I find very puzzling is that even though post-COVID, or you could almost say post uh, uh, the uh, Justin Trudeau government coming in has certainly, you know, backtracked on a lot of the fiscal consolidation that was reinforced by Stephen Harper. But I'm finding, you know, in Canada, we have an election, what, within the next couple of years, and already people are talking about fiscal probity, fiscal stability in Canada. They're already talking about in Canada, fiscal stability, government's gotten too big in Canada. And I don't hear anybody in the U.S. ever talk. They're talking about a whole bunch of things as we head into the next year's election. Nobody's talking about the fact that government has gotten simply too big. Uh, that the debt finance spending that's going on is completely out of control. And I guess the I guess, I guess that if the if the bond market remains an even keel, of course we have something different today than we had back in when you guys were helping run the government, which is central banks with this enormous balance sheet. Um, but I guess the question is, you know, how is it like from your perspective? And look, we are Canadians, but, uh, you know, we're the 51st state, but we're just nicer people and we speak better French. Uh, how, how is it that in Canada we're talking about fiscal policy right now, two years before an election with a better national balance sheet than in the U.S. where they have an election in less than a year? And, and, and a national balance sheet that's spinning out of control that nobody seems to care about or talk about. Yeah. Well, in part, I think there are a number of reasons. In part, I mean, people still do remember it was not unpainful uh, what happened in 94, 95, 96, right? People, they still remember and certainly among some people of, of that. And no great desire to have to 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 go through that again. Um, I, I mean, I think that's one reason. Uh, but I, I think the other reason is that that young people, right? Young people see that that unless um, the fiscal situation is reasonably stable. Their ability to to go forward uh, is going to be very low, and so the, we don't have the pressure uh, from the thirty year olds and forty year olds uh, for more spending uh, because what they would see that going to help others and not to help them. So I think I, I think there's a a generational dynamic that, as you pointed out earlier, David, we had a, a much younger population 30 years ago than we do now. We have something else coming up, I think, um, I think of this the next few weeks, which is the possibility of uh, the U.S. is going to hit the death ceiling again. And uh, we're going to have another one of these rounds of nail biting around a possible government shutdown. But maybe at some point, um, you know, the, uh, the more conservative membership, uh, of course, there's a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of these, uh, folks on the Republican side, um, you could argue are radical. Uh, but it seems to me as though the, uh, 
Congress just continues to find a way to kick the can down the road uh, and uh, continuously extend uh, these debt ceiling limits. And um, uh, I'm wondering maybe if, uh, depending on how the politics play out next year, it seems to me, as I don't know who the president's going to be, but I have a strong sense looking at the numbers that uh, the House and the Senate uh, are going to be controlled by the Republicans. Uh, so maybe that's the, uh, you know, maybe we, we avoid a crisis in the U.S. and it's just this political realization by whatever conservatives are left, even in the GOP, uh, start to take control of the situation. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, David, but if, you, it, 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 if the issue is treated simply as a fiscal issue, rather than as an issue of how the governments do what governments have to do for the bringing forward the benefits of the people, allowing the economy to grow and so on, uh, and, and having a reasonable, reasonable uh, stability and harmony in the economy. It, it, if it's always just green ice age of, of just fixing the numbers, then you don't get there. You only get there when you understand that fixing the numbers is what is essential for the good things that people want in the economy going forward. They want growth. They want a future. The young people want a future. Um, and and it, was, it was that change, if you will, when, when the Kretschian government came in that, that we're not doing it to fix the books. We're doing it that unless we manage this fiscal, we can't do everything that we collectively want to do. And in a sense, I think that's what has to happen in the United States. And, and, and you know, the, the uh, inordinate privilege is not the inordinate privilege it was 40 or 50 years ago in the United States. Um, this is a much more difficult situation the U.S. has to now work to preserve a confidence in the U.S. dollar that they didn't have to do before. Um, and I think this changes the game. And in that sense, the U.S. today, vis-a-vis -vis the world, is, is more like the smaller economy that we were against the world in, in 30 years ago. So... I think there's a lot there, and if the U.S. is to is to if people want a strong future in the U.S., um, then you kind of have to deal with the fiscal situation. You won't be able to to get there without fixing it. And the objective is not fixing the fiscal situation. The objective is getting where you want to go and overcoming this barrier that the fiscal situation presents. And, and, you know, far be it for me to comment on American politics, it's hard enough to understand my own. Um, but it has, it, it, it seems to me that for a long time, you've had various uh, commentators talking about the concerns around the U.S., the level of the U.S. debt. We've had this, this, debt ceiling crisis uh, repeat itself a number of times and somehow or other we stumble on and you know dire things don't end up happening and i think there's a little bit of um how many times can you call you know cry wolf before people stop listening to it um what was salutary in our case was that the wolf actually did come um and i think for Americans, I mean, what I would hope for, um, because as I watch the debates unfold, it, it, it uh, you know, it, it's hard to hear the voices of leaders saying, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about the well-being of America, not just the well-being of my party. <laughs> uh, and blaming the other side is, a, is there's, there's bipartisan consensus on that for sure. It's always the other side's fault. Uh, 
Um, and I think that doesn't make it easy then to try to fashion the kind of consensus that's that's really needed. Um, Mr. Kretschmann was masterful, as I described, at getting what I would call the spenders into the room and building that consensus, because without the consensus, then there could be no move forward. And um, and uh, I think what is needed, how you deliver it in America is another question, is uh, a sense of common purpose. Uh, we, we see this playing out now in so many different ways, both in trade and foreign policy, as well as in fiscal policy, where bipartisan consensus is hard to find on the war in Ukraine, uh, on the... Uh, on the developments in the Middle East, on foreign development assistance, on the WTO, on trade agreements with, you know, with Asia, uh, these these all become um, pawns in a in a partisan political game, making it very difficult for the rest of us out there in the world, who many of us grew up looking to the U.S. Uh, for global leadership to say there's somebody there that we can follow that can that can shape things to the benefit of the, the largest uh, you know number of people on the planet. Uh, that's getting harder and harder to believe. So looking for some kind of consensus in the US, terribly important because um, the world is not getting easier. It's getting more and more difficult. Well, you know, the just want to we're getting uh, towards the top of the hour, but look, we're, we're, we're really um, getting into a situation here in the States said at the beginning, what $34 trillion of federal government debt. Uh, if left unchecked, uh, that's going to go up at least $12 trillion uh, in the next eight years. And that, doesn't even that those are CBO numbers that don't even include the possibility of a recession. These numbers are going to go through the the roof, even the the published numbers, and it, there's there's not an interest rate low enough that's going to prevent interest costs yeah. from staring. They see. I'm trying to get to the crux of the matter here. Where did when did Canada, you know, the crisis? I don't think maybe there was this awareness after the first federal budget in ninety. When was it? In 93, 94? Yeah. Uh, okay. The reality is that for a few years, uh, we, we were, as David Dodge said, we were actually like almost a Ponzi scheme. We we're borrowing money to pay off the interest for existing um, uh, 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 borrowers. Uh, we, David Dodge said 30%. Okay. Never mind even the fact that, you know, We've blown through the Rogoff Reinhardt ninety percent. People say, "Well, but the S and P is close to a new high." And look at, you know, it's just everybody can't see past the tip of their nose. This might not be even in the next year or the next couple of years. Um, and you could have said that in Canada back in nineteen ninety one or ninety two. Number that David Dodge said: interest payments were absorbing thirty percent of the revenue base, uh, which seriously constricts fiscal flexibility. Uh, you, if the U.S. in the past year, the interest share of revenues has doubled to 15% of the U.S., we double again, we're at 30%. Right. And uh, we're going to reach a situation where the U.S. interest is about the interest payments. And, and interest payments are heading towards a trillion dollars. Yeah. And, and the, the, the issue is not, is not the debt. The issue is your ability to service the debt. And that, that is the critical thing. And, and so I don't think, you know, the, the 90% debt rule only can make sense in the context of where you think real interest rates are. And if real interest rates are zero or, or negative, as they were after the GFC, you can do a lot of crazy things and it, and it won't come home to roost. But as we look forward and look at the world we're looking at, we're looking at a world where real and real underlying interest rates are likely to be not in the order of minus one to zero, but in the order of plus one to plus two. And that changes the game phenomenally. And right 
quickly, you'll be able to see those net service charges as a share of revenue mount. And my rule, my rule on rather than debt to GDP is debt service to revenue. And if your debt service to revenue ratio gets over 10%, then you begin to get onto that slippery slope. And uh, that that is the issue. And that's sort of exactly where we are sitting right now. Yeah, we're 15% in the U.S. right now in that ratio. Right. So and 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 that I mean, that is where uh, where is trouble and where where the bond market becomes king again uh, because that that just the fear is that 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 can't be serviced. So, uh, I mean, I think the crunch, the real crunch is coming uh, in the United States, but I agree with John that you, you don't solve that crunch by focusing on that crunch per se, but you've got to focus on what it is that you want government to do, what framework the government is going to provide for the private sector, for growth and for equity uh, in in the future. And that that that's what's important. And the US is getting very close uh, to running into a situation where uh, where they are up against the wall just as we were at the beginning of the 90s. Look, this is uh, back to uh, to John Manley. Um, you cut program spending in two years. Cut uh, programs. But, but program, it program is spending, very is, important. Does he which cut is ex, ex interest, Well, to 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 mitigate the burden from interest costs. So, of course, program spending is just spending on programs. Ten percent decline. You 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 let go uh, forty five thousand civil servants. Um, you rewrote the social contract. I mean, Americans don't know that Canada had a, the sacred cow, which was truly crazy mm-hmm. for decades. Uh, it was enshrined uh, that uh, it was a hundred thousand dollar lifetime capital gains exemption. Hundred thousand back when hundred thousand dollars meant something. Lifetime mm-hmm. capital. So that was a. I mean, that was like taking a kid's teddy bear away. But the thing is that, uh, and and, and uh, the. You know the um, getting the government uh, or, or getting employer and employee sharing more. This is a, a another you can call it a surreptitious tax increase in terms of employment insurance contributions. Mm-hmm. The government found different ways to save money to save a lot of money. That money had to come from somewhere, so there were de facto tax increases. I know tax is a dirty three letter word. Tremendous spending restraint, but the government got so big. Tremendous spending restraint. And um, so John Manley, being in the cabinet, part of the federal government at that point, how did you sell that to the public? I don't I, I think that, you know, the politicians in the United States and I hope that somebody out there watching the wide webcast is going to send this off to the long their 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 uh, their local Congress men and congresswoman that you're rewarded with three majorities, despite the fact that you wrung the excess fat out of the fiscal system. So, A, how did you sell that to the public? Like, what lesson can you give to American politicians that are scared of their own shadow? We can't cut. I'm not going to get reelected. And then you guys got reelected with majorities three consecutive times. How'd you sell it and how'd you maintain it? Well, well, first of all, I think communication is an important element of of any policy, and it's and it's um, it's something governments try to master. And mostly, I think they've been they can be fairly ineffective at it. Sometimes their opponents are very effective at it. But the uh, you know just as an example of the communications device was actually used by the Mulroney government before we came in, where they would run um, television as with you know the canadian canadians have a have, have a dollar coin uh it's got a it's got a, a common loon on the face of it so it's lovingly called the loony uh and you know as you know in the financial markets often this the, the cid is referred to as the loony um these ads showed a loony with a big chunk taken out of it and it it was meant to communicate 
that every dollar that you gave to the federal government, you were getting 66 cents worth of services back for that. Because that big chunk was just going off to pay the, the interest rate, interest charges. That sort of device, I think people came to understand what the nature of the problem was. And I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. It, it. it wasn't. It wasn't easy. I think the other element was what we said before that everyone saw that everyone else was having to, you know, contribute to the solution of the problem as well. There was nobody got off, you know, scot free. There was no tax increase on you, but not on you, or reductions for special interests or any of those. Nobody got spared. I think fairness was key to it, um, and uh, I think that that the other element of it uh, was that um, the the benefits came so quickly, as David said earlier, much more quickly than we really hoped for or expected, that we were able to point to them, so that at re-election time it wasn't all doom and gloom. Some of that, admittedly, was good luck. Um, but I think it's also correct to say, if you pursue good public policy, good luck may help you. If you pursue poor public policy, then not only will good luck not help you enough, but you may get bad luck that will make things much, much worse. So, uh, you know, when they say in these jobs and politics, I was in federal politics 16 years, which as some of my family like to point out, that's more than half a life sentence for first degree murder in Canada. Um, but it's a, it's, I consider it a, a, an enormous privilege. Um, you don't do those jobs in order to not make the decisions that matter for your country. Very few politicians that I know in any country go into it for self-serving reasons. I know people are cynical about that, but I just, I don't know. I haven't met too many, too many people that are just in it for themselves. They're really, they're, they're hoping to do something good for their country. You don't miss those opportunities when they're given to you. You deal with what you have to deal with. And if ultimately you're unsuccessful or the voters disagree with you, well, then you did what was right. And to me, that's the essence of, of, of public leadership, uh, that you do uh, what's right, even when it's hard. And you hope that you do a good enough job of explaining it to the population that they will say, yeah, you know, okay, Manly, I, I didn't like it, but I guess you were right, and I'll give you my vote again. But if they don't, I can go home and say I did what I believed was right. So that's what I hope for America. Well, I, uh, you know, I would say that um, there's going to come a time when politicians uh, in the U.S. Uh, are going to be facing something similar to what to what Canada confronted back in the early 1990s. And all I can really say is that. Look what happened uh, north of the border. Uh, I mean, like I said, um, you know, we're, we're the 51st state, um, but we're nicer people. But we're still part and parcel of uh, of uh, of the continent. And what happened was that tightened fiscal policy, the government share of the economy, and the most unproductive segment of the economy is reduced as a share of GDP. And the lower borrowing pressure, the reduced fiscal pressure, the impact on aggregate demand brings down inflation dramatically, which then in real terms puts money in people's pockets. You bring interest rates down dramatically, which means that the hurdle rate for capital investment goes down and you get more CapEx growth, which is what happened in Canada. And I think that's why politicians should not fear uh, tightening the fiscal screws, especially when you consider 
where these deficits and debts are in the context of a fully employed economy. Uh, I mean, if I told either one of you uh, any time, 10, 20, 30 years ago, that we'd be talking about over 120% debt GDP, a uh, deficit of call it five, six percent of GDP, you'd be thinking, well, th this is, of course, we're in a recession. That's where you get in a recession. We're full employment. So I'm starting to think that maybe if there's a crisis coming in the United States, it's going to be in the next recession, which nobody believes it's going to happen this year. I, I personally think there's a good chance it will. What that does to the revenue base, uh, and then you're going to have an exploding fiscal deficit with the automatic stabilizers kicking in. Uh, and, um, and, and that could be the touch off point, but enough editorializing from me, let's just uh, finish this off with maybe a minute or two from each one of you. Uh, if you were, let, let's say that you're up there in the, uh, debates and in the, uh, Republican primaries right now. And let's say that, uh, well, let's even say that this hope is let, that this happens. Let, let's hope that the conversation at some point morphs away from some of the other stuff towards fiscal stability. What would be on your platform for the U.S. Uh, to turn this unsustainable deficit debt situation around? W w based on your Canadian experience, what are the things that you would bring to the table to do that? Well, I'd say one lesson that I learned in 93 and 94 was you don't be too specific about that until you've actually uh, taken the reins of government. So I think what they what they responsibly could be doing right now is is highlighting the challenges that face the country, given some of the numbers that you've cited, David, in terms of how this how the debt has, has grown in relation to the size of the economy, how much the interest charges are eating of government revenues. All of these things are pointing in the direction of a problem that has to be solved. But as soon as you get into in a pre-election period, the details of what you would do, you risk being picked apart. But you must be clear that you are going to have to act on it so that when the time comes, if you're given the, 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 the right to govern, you're able to say, I'm doing what I said I would do. Uh, I think otherwise, you uh, you know, you're, you're going to be seen as having been uh, disingenuous and once they don't trust you that's very hard for you to maintain confidence uh, in order to do some of the hard things. David Dodge, last word to you. Well, no, I, you asked a political question and you got w political wisdom from John, um, <laughs> right? Uh, the point is that uh, after the fact, uh, once, once we have a new administration in power, they're going, they are going to have to then deal with it. And you cannot, they cannot sit and duck doing, uh, dealing with it. Um, otherwise, before the end of a four year term, there will be a problem, so. Okay, well, um, that wraps up today's webcast. Uh, and uh, my hope is that the lessons from Canada some uh, 30 odd years ago uh, managed to soon resonate in Washington before it's too late. Uh, I want to thank David and John for taking the time today to do some public service, even though they're not uh, in the public sector. But this was certainly public service for all of us and uh, sharing their experiences and advice for everyone's benefit. Uh, thanks again to my two guests and thanks to all the viewers and listeners who attended today's call talk to you next week thank you david thank you all the david. Best,